This is John Abrams, and this is the Variety Artist, episode 54. That sound you hear is my squeaky chair, but it's also me patting myself on the back because I just finished the first phase of my resources page. Right now, you can go on that resources page and find the very best CRM in the business. It's called Show Operations. It was created by an entertainer named Pete Ellison. He's a friend of mine. Not only is Pete an entertainer, but he also has a background in high tech. He was tired of using three or four different apps to keep track of his customers, to send invoices, follow up emails, and basically run the biz part of his show biz. So he created show operations and wrapped it all up in one app. It can send an invoice with a single push of a button, keep track of all your customers. It even has a function that shows you all the places surrounding the gig you're doing. It's the one I use, and I just know you'll love it. Go to thevarietyartist.com and click the resources page. You'll find it there. Now, today's interview is a hoot. Not only will you learn about the fascinating art of hypnotism, Dale also throws in his favorite marketing tips. Dale K. brought it today. Have fun. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. Billed as the almost evil comedy hypnotist, he is hilarious. His comedy shows and keynote presentations go beyond stages and conventions. He's hypnotized over a million people in 20 countries over two decades. Variety artists, I give you almost evil comedy hypnotist, Dale K. I am here and I feel after that intro like I should be walking on stage. That's great, John. <laughs> here you are. This is kind of like a little stage. It really is. Thanks for having me. This is uh, cool. I'm excited. I've been listening to the podcast and I'm super stoked to be part of it. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. In fact, I was doing a little bit of research on you and watching your videos and things. I researched Dale K. Now, I don't know if you've read this or not, but when I typed in Dale K, here's what one of the things that came up. The Dale K's or Dalex are a fictional extraterrestrial race of mutants <laughs> in the British science fiction television series, Doctor Who, created by the megalomania, <laughs> megal wait, created by the megalomaniacal, wait, megalomaniacal, ha! Scientist <laughs> Davros of the planet Scaro to be an emotionless master race bent on universal conquest and domination, utterly without pity, compassion, or remorse. I live by that. That's my motto. <laughs> Listen, I get this question. I get this question a lot. Uh, I am aware of Doctor Who, but my my full name is Dale Kitchen. And when I was like 16, 17 years old, people would not believe that was my last name. So I would go uh, to a hotel and they would always try to add an S or an ING to it. Or I lived by a town called Kitchener. So people would put ER and stuff. It would get so frustrating. Uh, I just gave up and kind of did a bit of a name circumcision. <laughs> a, a couple weeks ago, I'm at a hotel and I had to call down to the front desk because I needed something. I forget what it was. So I pick up the phone, dial the number, <laughs> and the front desk person picks up the phone and doesn't say hello, nothing like that. She just immediately says, what? Oh. And, and then she starts laughing in a very awkward way. And then I start laughing because I realized what she did. On the caller display, it said kitchen. And she thought it was her buddy in the kitchen calling and bothering her. So we both had a good laugh over that. But I changed <laughs> the name just because it's easier. So I use that sometimes and then uh, use the K most of the other times. <laughs> well, your logo has the big giant K, right? Yeah, yeah. That logo has been around for a long time. Um, I, I, I love graphic design and I, I love the way we can mix it with the promotion. But the K is, has stuck around for a while. Yeah, your promotion is great. I was looking at some of your photos and your videos. They're terrific. Excellent. I go in waves, I'll do a marketing campaign and I'll kind of like, and I sh you shouldn't probably do this, you should stay consistent, especially nowadays, but uh, forever I'll go in waves where I'll, I'll do a campaign and then I'll disappear for four years. Like I, I, I won't put out <laughs> much new content and it's worked for me in the past, but right now so much is different trying to get in the mood and the, and the mechanics of using social media properly. Yeah, yeah, you and me both. I'm redoing my website. I redid my photos. I'm I'm listening to podcasts on on about Twitter, how how it works, and and how to make money off of it, and how to so increase. Much. Oh, it it, so it is. It's crazy when when you don't grow up in it, 
you have to learn it from scratch. And that's what I'm doing right now. And everybody who has grown up in it, it's just so natural to them. It's just like a reflex action to be on it. So it's definitely something that we have to be doing this older generation, us guys, we have to play the game still. All right, we're going to get into uh, uh, photography and we're going to get into your hypnosis. Let's talk about your hypnosis. Please, I know please. a lot of people listening to this, their first question is, is hypnosis real? And I get that all the time too. I'm, I'm um, sure. The, the, my best response is it's a shame because most people I think have the wrong definition of what hypnosis is. And when they carry that definition, that's not real. And that's whenever you think about hypnosis being about, you know, zombie like trances and lightning bolts coming from the hypnotist eyes, uh, swinging pocket watches, all those stereotypes that we've seen in, in movies and in TV. And especially from the, the years ago, that's just the wrong definition. And a lot of hypnotists don't like me for this, but I'm, I'm very, very honest. My definition of hypnosis is the ability to convince somebody that they're hypnotized. And I think when you break it down and look at it that way, it just becomes a little bit more acceptable and believable. And in my show, and I, I can't speak for other hypnotists, but when I have skeptics come to see my show, and if I meet them before the show, they'll be honest. I'm very skeptical. But the way I'm very honest on stage and I try to explain what's going on, you're, they're leaving there not only laughing, going, oh, that was the funniest thing I've ever seen, but they leave there going, now I get it. I'm not a skeptic anymore because now I understand that a good hypnotist is not controlling. You're actually motivated, which two different things, but the same outcome. Well, sure. In fact, one of the things that, that I love how you wrote this or whoever wrote this, Dale K will show you how powerful our motivation can be and how amazing your imagination actually is. I'll take all credit for that, actually. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's how I feel. That's the truth. Now, that's not how I started out because I started out like most hypnotists. You were supposed to speak in a dark voice. You were supposed to have a goatee. You must dress in a tuxedo. Like I started out that way, but as I've evolved over the 30 years, and, and really it was for business reasons, I, I switched it up a little bit and changed things along the way. And now the show is more true to me rather than just being true to what hypnosis used to be. Well, I think that, go, that goes for any art, whether you're a magician, hypnotist, juggler, hula hooper, whatever you do. For it, sure. It's smarter to be yourself within the context of your art. Yeah, and you'll know when you kind of, what they say, when you get in the pocket, like you know, it's just everything clicks. And that's just a great place for a performer to finally get to. In the zone. In the zone, for sure, yeah. Yeah. So what does a, a Dale K show look like? I've seen the videos, but, but tell our listeners, what, 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 what does it look like? Well, first of all, I'm going to be incredibly honest and go, I'm guilty of being one of those people that was always scared to upload constant video or let people in the theater record it. Always afraid that my material would be stolen or the act would just be burned out. I'm getting a little bit more comfortable putting more and more out there to see. So the show is it's the same framework as most hypnosis shows. You, you fill up the theater, you come out on stage, you with your credibility, you try and uh, explain to the audience what hypnosis is, you ask for volunteers, you get them to relax, and you do some really fun things. Uh, my show is different, and I think it's got a different fingerprint on it because of my personality. I've been lucky enough to be part of some organizations that have uh, given me a couple of awards, and one of them was uh, to be nominated for Comedian of the Year. So as a hypnotist to get that, that was kind of a big deal for me. Sure. Only because people understood that I'm funny, not just what I'm making the people do is funny. Um, and that goes a long way. The other thing I'm proud of is a long time ago, I realized you just don't get those volunteers to do physical things. If you give them the chance to talk, it can evolve into some of the most funny and memorable things you'll see in your career when you give those volunteers permission to actually speak rather than just you know play a violin, drive a car, uh, or that kind of thing. Yeah. In the end, I'm really proud of just, and I mentioned this earlier, how honest I am on stage and how we really make it all about the volunteers. Um, I know there's hypnotists out there that really try and make it about them, and I think they're missing out on so much. You should be making that hypnosis show all about those spectators on stage. They came up there. They are the show, technically. And a lot of times people in the audience, they know the people on stage. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they don't, but when they do, it's a real convincer for them because it's one thing to see somebody on stage going through this. The first time I did, I, I was 17 when I saw my first hypnosis show and I had no idea what I was even going to be watching. And 
at the end of it, I was so blown away. I was sitting there going, those people must just hop on a bus with him and they must all be paid actors. Like mm -hmm. this is incredible. Uh, but that's not the case at all. There are people that will stooge a show. And I've got mixed feelings about that. I've never done that in 30 years. I'd, I'd rather be behind the curtain sweating before the show starts, wondering if I'm going to get volunteers, <laughs> turn them into amazing volunteers. It's stressful every night, but I just, I like going that pure, pure way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my first job ever was at the Orange County Fair. I was I don't know, 14 or 15 years old. Uh, we sold these little sandbirds. You know what sandbirds are? I, what's no, no? It's, it's a stretched Coke bottle. So it's a, a glass Coke bottle that's stretched, looking, and the the, the top of it kind of looks like a bird. And then you put a little golf tee on it, and then you put different colored sand in it. <laughs> okay. So what we would do is I would go away for ten or fifteen minutes, then I'd come back to the booth and be a shill for the sandbirds and make a really cool looking sandbird and then everybody'd see me making this cool looking <laughs> sandbird and then they'd be like, Oh wow, I could do that too, even though they may or may not be able to. That's great. I, I, I get it. I, I love I do love the psychology of it all. I do, don't get me wrong. It's just, when it comes to a hypnosis show, I, I think if there's ever a time where you want it to be pure, I just feel like that's the time. And, and I leave there with a, a sense of pride every night, knowing that I was able to make maybe a show under poor conditions be a, a pretty decent show without, without stocking it. Yeah, I, I agree with you as, as a not 14-year-old. <laughs> I now agree with you. So I noticed in some of your videos that you dismiss a lot of the people. So how do you tell the difference between dismissing somebody and, and having somebody stay up there? Um, there's a couple situations. Uh, one, one is they should be putting on a show for the hypnotist, not their friends in the back of the room. And because that's what hypnosis is about, having that connection and rapport with the hypnotist. And you can just tell when you're on stage who's up there and who's really following your instructions and really doing this for you. You can just tell when the nervousness, somebody might be just tapping their foot, maybe they're chewing gum, and that's one of the instructions before you even volunteer, don't even, don't even uh, have anything in your mouth, no candy, no gum. When they come up breaking any of those rules that you've already given them, you know they're just not taking it seriously, so I, I'll get rid of them. Every now and then when somebody's, you know, you can see they're cracking open their, cracking open their eye and they're looking and kind of winking at their buddy like, hey, I'm doing it, uh. that's just not good, and that's not... In the beginning, when you're first starting out, you just need to experience things. So you'll, you'll let those people stay on stage because it does work. But if you get to the pure heart of what I believe hypnosis is, you get rid of all those people. It, it takes some experience. It takes some stage time to be able to narrow it down to those people that are really legitimately hypnotized. And I, I see some hypnotists that will put 25, 35 chairs on stage. Yeah. And, there's two reasons why they're doing that. Maybe more, but the two that I'm aware of is this. Number one, it's the law of averages. You, the more people you get to volunteer, the higher percentage of susceptible, susceptible, susceptible people. <laughs> I can't even talk. No, um, like me, megalomaniacal. Yeah. It's, that was yeah, it. We're on the same page. One and one. I'll, I don't keep score though. So uh, when uh, you, the more people you get up there, the chances are you're going to get better volunteers out of that. That's reason number one. Reason number two is is a back of room thing, which I didn't pick up on this until years into this. The more people on stage, the more they're going to either uh, want to see what they've done or their friends and family in the audience want documentation of what they did. So most hypnotists will record the show and sell the show after. So if you've got 35 people up there, you're making more money at the end of the show. Right, because more people are going to buy your DVD. Exactly. I get that, but I've seen some pictures where there's no room to have that many people up there and it becomes a safety issue they they've got 35 chairs up there when there's only really room for 10 so there's there's some give and take and some common sense that has to come of it but that's one of the other reasons why you see so many people on, on a on a stage for a hypnosis show sometimes well, I didn't even think about the safety thing. It, that's got to be an issue, right? My, that's my number one thing when people ask for advice. I give them three things, uh, but the number one thing is be safe. If you're just trying to make this into a, a little parlor trick at, at a party and you're never going to do it again, even then, be safe. The problem is I, if you're trying to make a living out of this, you want to be safe. And over 30 years, I am super fortunate, super fortunate. Uh, and I've also worked hard at, at making sure there's a safety level there. And unfortunately, there are some venues that I can't even go back to because uh, 
when I've gone to rebook the show, they've said, hey, sorry, since we've had you, we found somebody cheaper and somebody got hurt. So now we're not allowed to have any more hypnotists and they stop booking. So yeah, be safe. That's number one on my list. They get what they pay for. Yeah, unfortunately, that's sometimes true for that stereotype. Yeah, let's talk about some different uh, some different markets that you've yeah. gone after. Let's start. I was talking to Doug here. He was the one that referred oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Doug is great. He is great. He goes, you got to get Dale K on because he does a bunch of bachelorette parties. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, no. This is really what he said. <laughs> is this true? I am... I am trying to remember if I've ever done a bachelorette oh. party. Um, well, I, I, this is killing me. That's funny. I may have done one. Oh. Thing, but I don't, I don't even remember where I'm getting that kind of tagline. Wow, I'm going to have to call Doug up. Yeah, that's funny, huh? I don't know where you guys met, but uh, chances are it probably wasn't at a bachelorette party. No, I don't, I don't think it was. <laughs> Okay, well, let's talk about college campuses, because I know you do a lot of college campuses. I know a thing or two about colleges, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you market those college campuses? Oh, so much has changed. So much has changed, John. When I first started, there's organizations, just like every market, where they bring together the bookers and the talent, whether it's self-rep talent or agencies. So there are a few of those that do cater to the college market. And basically, it's like any other trade show. You go there, you stand in a booth, you either have an agent that's repping you or you're sitting there pitching yourself. And then if you're lucky enough, you'll get a chance to showcase in front of these buyers. So that avenue has been great, but that's, it's changing. It's, it's not, you know, the, back in the, the late 90s, the, the early 2000s, the numbers you would get from those avenues were great. They're still, they're still fine, but they're not like they were. So I see a lot of these people coming in thinking they're going to rule the day, you know, take over the Wild West, but that, that gold rush is just kind of gone. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing an amazing amount of contacting me from uh, people are contacting me through social media. Uh -huh. I'll get random emails because people are using, you know, YouTube, as they say, is the number one or number two search engine behind Google and mm -hmm. they're going to YouTube. That's why this stuff is so important. Oh yeah. You and I have been talking through Facebook, right? I know. I know. If you would have told me we, you know, years ago, this would be happening. I would never have believed you. Gosh, just a couple of years ago. It's crazy. We have showcases. I do a lot of elementary schools. That's my, that's my jam. Yeah. Uh, also libraries. So we have showcases and trade shows, the exact same thing. So are you saying that for colleges, those no longer go on or they're less? They're still, ha they're still happening, but the return on investment is just different. And you're, what, the problem is you're getting, you're not getting more buyers now, you're getting more acts. Mm. It doesn't matter if you're a face painter, a magician, a hypnotist, a juggler, uh, or a spoken word artist. It doesn't matter. Unfortunately, in most cases, you're all trying to take a piece of that pie. It's really amazing to me because every school has a different budget. And I don't know with your elementary school market if you feel the same way, but I'll have schools that spend $200,000 on a concert in the spring. And there they can have, you know, they've got more access in their budget. Then I've got schools that go, hey, you know, we only have $3,000 for the whole semester. Yeah. It's really all over the place. But once you find uh, the budget that works for you, and then the budgets are all over the place. Trust me, they're all over the place. Yeah, it's, it's the same with elementary schools. It's the exact same. You have PTAs that, that have thousands and thousands of dollars in the bank. And then you sure. have PTAs that have absolutely nothing to spend. Yeah, and I'm, I am, I mean, this subject is always touchy, you know, it's, it's hard, at least for me, as I grew as an artist, or a performer, or a businessman, whatever label you want to give me, one of the hardest things I ever had to do was attach another zero to my price tag. Mm -hmm. And in these markets, you know, there are people uh, going out for a solid price, then there are people going out for a half of that, and a third of that, whatever, like, it's just, everybody has their own price tag, and, and that affects the market as well. But usually, you know, usually, as they say, the cream does rise to the top. But yeah, the college market is still something that I think hypnotists should consider because there's still money to be made there for sure. Um, I think one of the hardest things about it is b building a thick skin because these college students, they're not full-time bookers. This is something they do for fun. Most of them aren't making any money. Some of them get, you know, a small dollar amount. Most of the time, these kids are there just for the experience of putting on events. And a lot of the times these events are for 
people that don't go out and party. They're trying to keep those students away from the bars and drinking. Ah. Yeah, that's, that's the goal. So that's why, that's why there is such a market for it still is because there's a, another reason. It's not just about entertaining these kids. It's about kind of eating into their time where they could go out and get into trouble. That makes sense. I think if you ask anybody who does the colleges, you have to have a thick skin for the different venues because one day you're in a brand new you know, state-of-the-art theater with 2,000 seats and those kids are screaming for you and you feel, it's the one time in your life where you feel like a rock star. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, it could be a noon show and you're in a cafeteria begging for attention and you're <laughs> on a smaller stage. There's maybe 45 students there. They're all interested in being on their phones or they're interested in eating. The last thing they want is to be entertained by some guy in the corner. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a grind too. So these dates nowadays, if you don't take them when they're offered to you, they just go to somebody else. If their heart's not set on you and they're not flexible, you're in trouble because uh, if you can't make the date, they will find another hypnotist, another juggler, another magician, another whatever uh, to slot you in. So you find that you start taking dates. You start uh, in August, I'll, for instance, I'll do, <laughs> I'll do 21 flights in the month of August. Mm -hmm. That's 21 different airports. And that's not connecting. I mean, daily flights only because these schools have a certain date in mind. If you don't make it work, like I said, they're going to go to somebody else. So it, it, it's a real grind. And if you want to go out there and hustle, you may get some real enjoyment out of it. But if you're not into slugging it out on the road and traveling, yeah, it could be a tough market for you. Wow. Well, what about uh, keynote speaking for, for corporate events and such? Uh, another avenue. Uh, another, it's unfortunately, you know, at one time it was a blue ocean. Now it's getting a little red because it's kind of a trend where entertainers go, hey, I think it's time for something different. Maybe I can get over into the keynote speaking market. And that's a whole other beast unto its own. Yeah. Uh, there are some hypnotists that I know that are doing it. A lot of magicians do it. Uh, I've had not a bad experience so far with it. I'm excited about it. it, it it's going well. At the end of the day, for me to be happiest, I'm not one of those acts that just stick in one market. I, I, I like to do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit over there, just for my own sanity. When you do a keynote or when you're selling a keynote uh, speaking engagement, are you, are you selling a specific uh, subject? You know what? I, I do sometimes, but it, I, it's great, I think, when it comes to this, when the client presents, you know, ask the client if they're looking for anything. It's not that mm. hard to work your material around what that client wants. And if you give them what they want, it, it's, it's a win-win. It's marketing 101. It really is. Want. But yeah. I'll tell you right now, you need to deliver uh, strong content. If, they're, if, you, if you're hired just to do your show, that's one thing. But when they're bringing you in and they want some meat on the bone, uh, they can smell mm. a fake or a, a mile away. So. Don't think too much about your uh, hypnosis or your motivation part or your magic tricks that you're using or your mind reading. You have to really make that the smaller portion of the presentation and then wrap all the good stuff around it. Yeah, I always suggest that your art is the vehicle that you use to present whatever subject matter. Exactly, in that scenario, for sure, for sure. So, that, so I was reading that you do some hypnosis on the radio. Did Doug Shear tell you that too? <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, if Doug listens to this, he's, uh, he's going to give me, give me a call. Uh, man, I, maybe he's right, and I just don't know what I'm talking about. You know what? Yeah, I've done some stuff in the past. Uh, not a whole lot. I do a little bit to promote shows. But this is years ago when I was doing more public appearances. You would go on there, and of course, you would usually it would be a situation where it was a radio show, and there'd be more than one host. So you would actually try and hypnotize the, one of the other people that were hosts of the show because the listening audience really had a connection with them. Or they would ah. bring in, they would give the chance for some listeners to come in. You know, you'd have five or six listeners that loved the radio station, and you would put them out. When I say put them out, put them to sleep, get them into a relaxed state. Yes. And then you would do, yeah, hypnosis on the radio. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to do visual things. You want to do things that were, you know, were more audible, things that the listening audience could hear and connect to. If you were to do something physical, it all mattered on your presentation, also the strength of the host that would able to uh, communicate with the listening audience what they were seeing. 
in, in real time. Yeah. But yeah, it's a great avenue. It's a great way still to promote for sure. It's free advertising. Absolutely. And, and who doesn't like free? All right, let's talk promo photos. Yeah. Because you have some great promo photos and it's ha- ha- happens to be one of your passions, right? You know what? I, the great thing about the hypnosis show is that I've been able to connect with some things that I always wanted to connect with. And one of them was marketing. I love marketing. Really love marketing. When it came to marketing the hypnosis show, I think I did my first headshot and poster probably back in 1995-ish for the hypnosis show because before that I was a magician essentially. And uh, when I made the transfer into the hypnosis world, I just, the original headshot looked like everybody else. It was a a five by 10 uh, black and white me staring seriously into the camera. And Mm -hmm. I ran with that because you know, that's what I thought a hypnotist was and should be as time went on though. And you're looking at this from totally a business perspective, you have to stand out from, from the competition. And, a lot of people will say, oh, there is no competition when you're an artist. And I'm like, well, I think there is. And if you're not competing with other people, at least think about competing with yourself because that will motivate you to do bigger and better. When it came to the marketing and the headshots, the photos, posters, whatever they were, the content was for, I thought it would look best if I didn't look like a hypnotist. So I went through a series of promo ideas where – I didn't want to look like a hypnotist. And people would tell me, that's crazy. If I look at your picture, I should know what you do. And I always had success when people would look at the picture and go, wow, that looks pretty cool. I don't know what you do, but I really want to know what you do. So then they dig deeper. Then they actually do a little homework on me. Then they actually try to reach out and connect with me. Their interest is piqued by those photos. It really demonstrated some power when... Hollywood years ago, something happened. A cloud came over LA and they went, okay, we're going to make hypnosis TV shows. And I got the calls for all of them. I always got the call. So I would go out there and do these television pilots that unfortunately never aired. But I would say, how did you find me? And they go, we put your pictures out on our desk and you were the only one had blonde, spiky, crazy hair dressed in an orange pleather suit and didn't look like a hypnotist. Everybody else had a pocket watch. Everybody else, you know, looked the same. It's just easy, easy business one-on-one to stand out. The photos, they almost sold itself. What's interesting about your photos, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're way different than anybody else, just like you're saying. But I guess I'm agreeing with you because I see your photos and I say, I say, well, I'm not sure exactly what that guy does. And then I'm reading all of the stuff that you do. Yeah, there's a fork in the road there. Some people may just give up, but there's so many people that I felt have looked at the images. And my images that, I'm, that are on my website now are so-so. I, I had a more creative streak years ago where I had, a, I had a pocket watch in the picture, but I also had a sledgehammer and I was smashing it. Or I had <laughs> booster cables. Uh, there's a poster of me, maybe you can find it online, uh, where it looks like I'm being electrocuted and I've got booster cables around my hands. There's lightning. I think it says high voltage humor and has my name at the top. That yeah. poster was done in 1998 or maybe even 99. That's when Photoshop still came in a big box the size of a shoe box. Oh, yeah. It was expensive. That's when most acts just had, especially as comics, they just had a black and white headshot. And I, I said, okay, I got to be different. I have to stand out. I had a minivan at the time, sold the minivan and spent, you're going you're gonna to laugh at this. Yeah. I spent $7,000 on that poster because I yeah. went to a graphic artist. I went to an ad agency and I had it printed. And back then to do all that stuff and do it properly, it was, it cost that. But now, oh, the technology, wow, we can do all this stuff right off our phone. It's unbelievable. So you sold your car. So what was the ROI on that? It was huge. I imagine. Because uh, that poster was so strong. Uh, it was a poster and I also used it as an ad. I actually grew up in Canada and I, and I did it up there. And right before I came down to make Chicago my home, I used that as kind of a, I didn't want anybody in the States to think about, think, oh, who's this new guy? I wanted them to think I'm already established and I've already been doing this for a long time. I didn't want to start all over because I had such a good career in Canada. I didn't want to start all over when I came down to the U.S. So that really put me on the map with agencies. I think it, <laughs> it concerned other hypnotists, which I, I think is funny that they bought into my hype. 
it was just so funny to to have other hypnotists go, oh, yeah, I've seen the picture or I saw the ad in the trade magazine. It opened up the door of the agencies. It's helped with more TV projects. Yeah, I, go big or go home. That's how I feel. Yeah, two two things about that. First, can I put that on on your on your page? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll put that on there. So if somebody listening to this wants to see it, they can just take a look at your page and see that that photo. You've got two things. I'm going to interrupt you though. Go ahead. An, an, another lesson to be learned is is that sometimes you have to know when to be yourself. So that poster really suited me. The energy my age, everything about that poster worked for me. What I found out, and is, it was amazing to see, other hypnotists started taking booster cables and trying to incorporate <laughs> them in their picture. And it made no sense because their energy was different. You know, I had the spiky hair, the crazy, it looked like I was maybe getting electrified, but I've got somewhere, I've got a collection of other hypnotists that thought it would be cool, I guess, to take these two cables and wrap them around their neck while they're smiling pretty at the camera. And it just made no sense. I'm like, what are you doing? So there's a lesson to be learned about making sure that you're you in your promotion too. So sorry, continue with your number. No, that, that's okay. You're, yeah, you're like, go ahead, put jumper cables on you. Go ahead. Yeah, I had to Spend mention the money. it. It's, it's just, yeah, I had to mention it. <laughs> Don't steal. Well, the second thing I was going to say, when you do present a photo that looks like that, that is so different than everybody else, there's a confidence about that photo. There's a confidence about you. And when you present that photo or have that in your arsenal, there's some sort of a confidence. So when other magicians or other hypnotists look at it, they go, well, this guy's confident. He knows what he's doing, or at least it appears that he knows what he's doing. Exactly. And it's a good way to crash the market. It, it is a good way to crash the market. But for everybody that's listening that may think, though, that person's got all kinds of confidence. I'm telling you right now, one of my one, number one fears is being in front of a camera. I, I really still to this day, I'm not comfortable. And people will look at those images and go, what are you talking about? Look at all this. And after time goes by, you learn how to take a good picture. You learn what to do and what not to do. You, you're well aware of whatever uh, silly, shallow imperfections you may have physically. Uh, you learn how to cover those up and make that picture the best because you're spending money, you're spending time, and you want that picture to work. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. So before you go into your photo shoot, are you kind of planning the idea of, for example, the jumper cables yeah. or the, fire, the hair on fire or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the first time I ever went into a real professional shoot, I went in prepared because it costs so much money. I just, money that I, that I didn't have, I didn't want to waste, waste the opportunity. So I went in there and we did two days. I had everything listed out. I had all the props, everything was organized, and everybody was very impressed by that because usually they don't get that. So the makeup artist, the director, the photographer, they can do their best work if you're organized. And if you're organized and you're, everybody's doing their best work, you're going to have more time to do more photos and you're going to get a real bang for your buck. Mm. It's, it's a great experience. I, I mean, even though the quality from a phone has become acceptable now, I'm telling you, save up the money, find a really good photographer and, and go the professional route because you just learn so much. Some, you just, yeah, you learn a ton. A couple episodes ago, we had Michael Messing and Tom Vorjahan on here who uh, are photographers for entertainment photographers is what they are. If you come to them with or without a plan, they'll make it work. But if you have a plan, it's way better because then you can have your props or what you're looking at or, or whatever makes your photograph special. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to move on to fact or something John just made up. Does that sound like fun? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. I'm going to give you a headline. You're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Are you in? I'm in. All right. First headline. The audience screamed as a bat flew around and dove at Dale during a show. That is completely true. <laughs> is that during a show? In Buffalo, there's a theater. It's like an old cathedral-like theater. I'm doing the show. <laughs> All of a sudden, well, I'm at the point where you know, I'm trying to put these people to sleep. I'm trying to get these people to relax so we can actually do a show. And during that moment, that special sensitive moment, 
there are shrills and screams coming from the audience. And I'm, I don't know why they're screaming. I'm looking at the, my volunteers. I'm going, is somebody, you know, doing something crazy? Is there, yeah. what's going on? I'm trying to figure it out while still continue to be a pro and, and do the show. Well, I look into the audience and it's, you know how it is when there's stage lights on you. It's like a, a car coming at you at night. You can't see what's behind those right. lights. Well, I look and sure enough, a bat swoops down over the, <laughs> over the heads of the volunteers on stage. I'm freaking oh. out. I'm laughing like a little schoolgirl. At the same time, I'm trying to do a show. I'm trying to duck from the bat. It was the craziest thing ever because it just kept swooping and diving. And then it would go into the audience. And the great thing about this is I had cameras set up. So I actually have GoPro footage of being attacked by a bat. I got to get it oh. posted. Got to get it posted. It's funny. You've got to put that on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> next. Okay, next one. Next to headline. During a show, one of Dale's volunteers developed a German accent. <laughs> I'm going to say no. Okay. Because I'm pretty sure that you snuck that one in there. But I got to tell you, yes, I, I've seen stuff where volunteers do do that. D during the show or, or, or afterwards? You know what? During the show, but sometimes it'll linger while they're still in the theater. Nothing permanent. Nothing permanent. But sometimes these people will take the characters with them uh, until they leave the theater. <laughs> oh, that's great. I can just imagine them going home and doing some of the things that you do. It, it's, it, you know what it is? is I try to make it such a positive experience on stage. And when you have that crowd applauding for you, it's something that you don't, the average person doesn't get on a daily basis. So they, they, I try to let that linger as much as possible. So putting the spotlight on them drags it out. They don't, it doesn't go home home, but within that theater, that venue, that still plays out. Yeah, I haven't really thought about that that much. You know, we're used to it. We see it all the time. Oh, we feel yeah. it all the time. But somebody who's never had it their entire life and then suddenly they, they get applause and laughing. And, and that's, yeah, that's one of the great things about a hypnosis show is that you're giving those 10 people a real gift because they're just not up there for two minutes, five minutes, like a you know, normal volunteer for a juggler or another act would be. You've got those people up there for a, a significant amount of time, 45 minutes up there. So it's a real positive gift that you're giving those people, not, not just the gift you're giving to the audience as well. All right, next one. Dale fell asleep during a Vegas magic show. When he woke up, the magician was looking right at him. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Oh, man. This is great. And I am going to name names, actually. So, yeah, out in Vegas, having a great time. And we go to... Uh... <laughs> We go to a, a magic show and I'm there with uh, some friends of mine, uh, Jeff and Tessa Evison are there, uh, a couple other performers are there and I was exhausted. I was just exhausted. The show, I'm not going to say whose show it was. Okay. The show was not, oh, I want to though. Um, the show was not. You can tell me afterwards. The, the stereotype of him or the rumors about this particular performer, it, it just... It wasn't that great of a show, sorry. Okay. So on top of me being exhausted and the jet lag or whatever, I fell asleep. My head goes back. I hear some loud music. My eyes open up. I realize I'm sleeping and my mouth's open. I might have even been drooling. Who knows? <laughs> and I look up and I am not lying right above us. He could have picked anywhere in the theater to make his entrance right above us. He's about to appear in the audience and I'm looking up and I make eye contact with him and he looks at me like I am the biggest jerk ever for sleeping. And I just go, I just shrug my shoulders. I got nothing to say. I'm like, oh, sorry. Yeah, what are you going to do? Oh, and all my friends are laughing at me. And yeah, so I did. I fell asleep at a major Vegas show. Oh, another YouTube video. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. All right, next one. When auditioning for AGT, Dale hypnotized one of the producers. When the producer woke up, he thought that Dale hadn't yet auditioned. A uh, big no on that one. Uh, no, did not happen. Did not happen. And although I think the show is great for many reasons, I have not, uh, I have not tried to uh, apply for that spot. Well, here, here's a question for you. When, 
people are hypnotized afterwards do they remember what they've done uh, there's a linger there they remember but they've been encouraged not to remember and because it's been so easy following the hypno hypnotist suggestions there's a great time after a show where most hypnotists will have you leave the stage not remembering that you were part of the show and then you do remember when you leave the theater when you when you leave it go through a doorway go underneath an exit sign and I'll still do it most of the times. It's because it's so it's so powerful. When you go up to those people, they forget that they were even on stage, and then they remember when they're in the lobby of the theater, and you see them, you know, see them smile, you see them laugh, and, uh, and then they remember everything at that point. But they remember; they're being encouraged not to remember, so they start to get caught up in their own imaginations, and it gives us all the illusion, like, "Whoa, is, does this person remember? Do they not remember? What's going on?" Wow. Yeah, it's, it's powerful stuff. It's fascinating. I, I, I always think the psychology of hypnosis is very shallow, but it's still pretty fascinating to me. So their friends are in the lobby and, and saying, oh, well, you were up there doing whatever. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes they'll say, yeah, or sometimes they'll say, no, I wasn't. Yeah, they'll, they'll deny that they were even part of the show. I was watching the, the show the whole time. It's crazy. I know. I know. I would never believe this stuff until I've seen it. Wow. All right, next one. Dale set himself and a cameraman on fire during a shoot. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. The answer is yes. <laughs> oh! I can laugh about it now, but it was not funny at the time. I'm sure. And this was for another photo shoot. It was a little video. It was a long day of shooting, and I just wanted to do this in one take. I had done it before. The setup was this. You've got the camera, very expensive, $50,000 camera on a, on a tripod, chair in front of it, and on the chair was a pane of glass that was there to protect the camera. So basically, I was spitting fire at the glass, and the fire would fan out on the pane of glass, and it would be a nice transition for the video you, yeah. you know, to go into the next scene. So I've got a cameraman and my buddy at the time behind that glass, and because I was anxious to be done and do it in one take, I took a, a good mouthful of fuel, took a really good stance, and I really spit an amazing, beautiful flame at that camera. Oh, so no. mission, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So mission accomplished. Number one, I was able to uh, get it in one take. Number two, that fire wrapped around the pain was amazing, but it went all the way around that glass and hit the cameraman. His hair caught on fire. My buddy started patting out the cameraman's hair. While this was happening, I nailed this precise angle where the fire not only went around that glass pane, but it bounced right back to me. Yeah, and I've got a little bit of fuel you know, leaking out of the corner of my mouth. Uh, you know, I'm, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm a pro, but this particular day, when you work with fire kids, you got to stay on your toes. Yeah. I knew what I was doing. I had done this a hundred times before, but you know what? I slipped up. You don't want to make these mistakes. So that fire came back, caught my shirt on fire, oh. and my face is starting to go on fire, and you're, you're going, okay, I've got this fuel in my mouth. I can't swallow it. I can't spit it. What do I do? Oh. And then all I can think is stop, drop, and roll. So as I – again, I'm laughing at it now. As I Ugh. go to stop, drop, and roll, I didn't realize that the commotion with the camera, while they were patting each other out, they bumped the pane of glass, and the glass had now fell on the floor and shattered. So now I am, I'm, <laughs> I'm oh, rolling no. around on pieces. Thank God the pieces were flat. It wasn't like a pop bottle, a Coke bottle. These were flat pieces so i didn't get cut up but the idea of the whole thing and fortunately i had all kinds of props there for the shoot and we had a snorkel and i just told my buddy run to the restroom fill up the sink with water and i am so lucky that i don't look any more goofier than i do today because my face was a wreck at the time i it looked like a, my face was made of wax and my ear was melting a bit and skin was just oh, terrible and i think to this day what saved me was uh i put my head in water immediately and used that prop snorkel i had for the photo shoot and i think doing that for a good solid hour and a half saved <gasps> Um, spent one night in the hospital, spent the next several months though, all bandaged up with really thick burn ointment on my face. 
and I, going out into the sun was a no-no. So I had to wear a big sombrero going into the convenience store. I had a sombrero on and my face was all had this salve and paste on it. And in the summertime, it would melt onto my shirt. So I looked like a monster. I scared many children that, that summer. Uh, the good news is I only missed one or two uh, shows back in the day when I wasn't, I was, wasn't working as busy as I am now. So moral of the story is I don't do fire stuff anymore. It's not needed. That's crazy. Everybody's on fire. You got a glass on the ground. You. I broke a lot of silly rules when I was younger, and that was one of them. And, you know, we weren't even supposed to use fire in the venue that we had rented. So I really was an idiot at that point. But, yeah, crazy stuff. All right, here's a bonus. Bonus for you. You don't even know this is happening. Great. I stalked your Facebook. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't even do that. Here's one for you. After a flight, you'll appreciate this, hopefully. Uh, after a flight, while picking up his luggage, Dale once had to pull a peanut butter sandwich <laughs> off one of his cases. The answer is true. And... <laughs> This is, oh man, flying is not fun like it used to be. It actually wasn't at the baggage claim. This was going through TSA. Mm. Like most of the entertainer travelers out there, we've got the TSA pre because it's just easier to, you don't have to bring out your laptop or anything like that. Every now and then somebody is coming through there as a newbie or there's an overflow. So they send a family through, which is fine, but it gets a little frustrating when, when you travel so much and you just, you've got your system. So I put my, I put my luggage on the conveyor belt yeah. and uh, the gentleman in front of me has one of those pre-made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that you get, crustables or something. I don't know yeah. what it is. I gave them a plug. It's in a you know, small cellophane package and he puts it in one of those little round dog dishes that go through for your valuables. And I looked at this situation and as my baggage is going through, I just went, I know what's going to happen. I can literally see what's going to happen. Sure enough, on the other side of the... Uh, x-ray machine the bowl comes out empty and the wrapper comes out without the sandwich of course and half the sandwich comes out <laughs> and then i just go yeah this is not gonna end good and i pull out my luggage and it's just like somebody dumped peanut butter and jelly on uh, on my backpack and on my carry-on and <sighs> it's not that that's the end of the world but it's just the guy didn't even say sorry. He found it so funny. He just giggled and shrugged his shoulders. And I'm like, oh, you remind me of that Vegas show when I shrugged my shoulders and laughed at the act I saw. Nothing you can do. Sorry. But yeah. funny stuff. <laughs> what are you going to do? What do you do? <laughs> well, it's funny now. It's funny now. Like some of these stories. Not funny at the time, but funny now. That was Back Ooh. or something John just made up. Ah. All right, so give us one piece of advice for the beginner. We have a lot of, of uh, beginners listening to this podcast. Uh, what's some advice you can give for somebody just starting out? Uh, okay. Do you want just one? Whatever you want. Because I'm, I'm passionate about this because everything that I teach other people about hypnosis or business, uh, it's, it's just from a lot of me failing. I've really learned from failing so or desperation to pay the rent, one of those two things. Uh, there's a great line. I think it's Les Brown. Uh, you don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. Mm. And when I hear that, I go, wow, yeah, trying to be perfect, trying to make sure your actor show is perfect is just going to hurt you. It's never going to be perfect, so you're never going to get on stage or you're never going to try new material. When it comes to a hypnotist specifically, there's three things. Uh, number one, we've already covered. It's be safe. Uh, choosing material or working in situations that are going to cause safety issues, uh, just stay away from that. You don't want that. And no fire. No, nah, yeah, no, no fire, yeah. <laughs> and number two, I'm never going to live this down. I don't tell too many people that story. But this is <laughs> well, bad. now people know. Yeah, well, Doug Shear knows too. Uh, number two, uh, be creative. Here's a few reasons for this. It's fun. It's healthy, and it'll set you apart from, from the competition. Number three, don't steal. Do the best that you can. We're all inspired in the beginning. When I did my first show, I had everything planned out. I had everything planned out in my hypnosis show, what I was going to do. I was going to be different. And what happened was I had only seen one or two hypnotists at that time. I got into a groove where I started imitating the other hypnotists, the only thing that I knew. So get out of that rut in a hurry. 
because at the end of the day, it's just not good. If you're going to use stock material, like let's say you're a magician and uh, you're going to saw somebody in half, put a twist on it. Put yeah. something on it that, that makes it yours. Same for hypnotists. If you see something, the, the, the fam- there's a famous bit out there. It's a pregnant bit where you tell a guy, a man, oh, you're pregnant. You're having a baby on stage. It's funny. It's cute. But make it yours. That's a standard stock thing. Do something else to make it yours. Mm. And that goes a long way. So yeah. all those things will have a, a valuable uh, byproduct for you there if you do them. But one of the things that were great for me for following those rules was I got the respect from peers or people that I respected that were professionals, um, full-time working pros would break the ice with me to tell me how much they appreciated my work because I followed those rules. So um, there's three, four little bits. I know you only asked for one, but no, that's good. Those all together really is amazing thing because you, you'll get a pool of people that you've always respected to respect you back keeps your stuff original and when sure. a buyer is looking at you and the other guy they're looking at all original material yeah and there, there's definitely times where some people won't care how original you are but there are times when you will win an opportunity over somebody else because of your originality and in the end that makes you a, a pretty uh, diverse performer well how about some advice for the working pro or is it the same you know what? <laughs> it's yeah. I got three things. Number one, be safe. Number two, be creative. <laughs> Number three, don't steal. Uh, and it's there's a karma thing here because I have been ripped off a lot. It's frustrating. It sucks. I've had somebody package something that belonged to me and sell it, and that sucks too. But I'll tell you right now, you. Don't carry that cloud over you. Um, you've got to let it go. Just let it go and, and work hard to be creative for, for the next thing. Mm. And you know what? Be nice. I, I do work some cruise ships. Be nice. I see a lot of acts come on that aren't nice to the technicians, the stagehands. Sometimes there's situations where you don't have to be an amazing act. You can just do a great show and be a nice guy rather than have an amazing act and be a jerk. Yeah. That goes a long way. People want to work with nice people. That's true. It's yeah. really true. And, and off the top of my head, there's two more things that I think matter. Um, don't obsess over your competition. Take mm-hmm. a peek every now and then. I made a point. I, I've probably only seen maybe eight in 30 years. I've maybe seen eight different hypnotists because I, I don't, I just, I just stay away from that. I don't want to be influenced too much unless there's somebody that I really hear about that I really respect, like a Darren Brown or somebody like that. Sure. I'd be more than happy to, to, to watch. The other thing is to stay healthy mentally and physically because you're going to need it. It, it could be a real grind out there. If you're headed to a cruise ship and you're lugging your luggage around, you might have to take that physically, not just from the plane, but take that down a pier that could be 50 yards of walking on cobblestone where you're lugging your luggage around. And mentally, it, it's hard. The, this business is not always easy. So staying in shape mentally will, will, will help you in the long run as, as well. Right, physically and mentally. Absolutely. Well, you came up with a hypnosis course recently. Tell us about that. Uh, It was something I told myself I would never do, to be honest with you, because I didn't want to create more competition because of all this insecurities that I might have about work or my craft or whatever. And as time went on, I have so many people ask for help. And it turns out that I get a real joy, a real fulfillment about helping people. I've, I've been writing and consulting for not only other hypnotists, but for other performers, um, singers, magicians, jugglers, whatever. I get a real pleasure in helping somebody and being part of their success. So it wasn't that long ago. Well, well, it was. It was a few years ago where finally I got fed up with finding out yet another venue that I wasn't able to work in because a hypnotist prior to me did something wrong. Uh-huh. Caused an issue, so they weren't able to be booked. So I'm now seeing a pool of hypnotists that maybe can learn from from my mistakes. So I've worked on creating some different projects. One is for the beginner, and the other is for a seasoned professional. Mm-hmm. I think I've got some advice and experiences all along the way that I really want to want to share. That is all going to be located at stagehypnosislab.com. Oh. Right now, go there put in your info and uh, you will get some information in the very near future about the new projects that I'm really excited about that I think will help the beginner and help the pro. I'm excited about that too. 
I'm glad you're excited. Uh, the other quote is a rising tide lifts all boats. That's I don't know right. if you started that, but I never used to think that way. And these last few years, I'm really embracing it. So I'm excited about all of it. Well, I was just at uh, Performers University two days ago. And oh, great. All of us SoCal uh, performers, we all kind of get together and we share information and things. And it is absolutely true that a rising tide, you know, rises all boats. Or- it really is. It really is. Do you have a book rec- recommendation for us? Um, the one I'll give you now is uh, the author and not just one of his books. This is that time of social media, as we all know. Mm. And I will tell you, if you don't know Gary Vaynerchuk right now. Oh, yeah. Podcast King. Yeah. Nothing to do with hypnosis. Everything to do with motivating yourself if you're self-employed and also marketing. Wow. His books are amazing. I've been following him for a few years now. I I can't get enough of them. Gary Vaynerchuk. Check it out. Okay. I'm going to put that on your show notes too because I'm a big fan too of you and you know, Gary. I appreciate that. (laughs) Well, thanks Dale for doing my podcast. It was fun. John uh, really had a good time. Uh, Keep doing this because I think you're putting out some great stuff. That's really going to help a lot of people. Oh, thanks. And your interview is going to help a lot of people. Awesome. Where can someone get a hold of you? If someone wants to get a hold of you, do they do email, uh, Facebook? How does that work? Email's great. Uh, Websites, dalek.com. Email is Dale at DaleK.com. But uh, you know what? Dale K Hypnotist on Instagram. And of course, you can find me somewhere lingering around, around Facebook. And I, a bit of an accountability situation. I'm promising everybody that my social media is going to get very, very uh, well attended to in 2019. Yep, me too. Let's do it. Thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend to listen. Uh, say, listen to this podcast. That's how we can spread the word. Take a look at my resources page. I worked really hard on that. And take a look at show operations. It really will make your life easier. You can reach me at john at the variety artist.com or find me on Facebook or join my Facebook group at the variety artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.